Okay, good afternoon and welcome to Grand Rounds. Um, I'm Suzanne Doblecki Lewis, Chief of the Division of Infectious Diseases. And I wanted to welcome you to the Hoffman Ratson Lectureship and give a quick introduction to the Hoffman Ratson Lectureship. Um, before our formal introduction today. Uh, the lectureship was established in 2005 by grateful trainees of doctors Thomas Hoffman and Kenneth Ratson, who headed the infectious disease training programs at University of Miami Jackson Memorial Hospital and the Mount Sinai Hospital in the 1970s. Dr. Thomas Hoffman received his medical degree at the University of Pennsylvania before completing a fellowship in infectious diseases at the University of Rochester. Dr. Hoffman was chief of infectious diseases at the University of Miami from 1970 to 1998. And Dr. Kenneth Ratson completed his medical degree at Harvard Medical School before residency training at Columbia Presbyterian Hospital and ID fellowship at New England Medical Center Hospitals in Boston. Um, Dr. Ratson was chief of infectious diseases at the Miami VA Medical Center in 1972 before moving to Mount Sinai where he served as chief of infectious disease until June of 2020. Uh, during his time at Mount Sinai, Dr. Ratson served in various leadership roles as chair of Department of Medicine, director of medical services, and the program director for the internal medicine residency program. Both Dr. Ra Hoffman and Ratson's expertise was widely recognized by the community, and they both set high standards for their trainees. I can attest to that. Um, this visiting lectureship was established to bring ID leaders from around the country to the University of Miami to honor the tradition of scholarship set by these outstanding leaders. Um, the Division of Infectious Diseases is thrilled to host Dr. Helen Boucher, Dean of the Tufts University School of Medicine, and a thought leader in the field of infectious disease and antimicrobial resistance as this year's Hoffman Ratson Grand Rounds speaker. So thank you, and I, with that, I'm gonna turn uh, the mic over to Dr. Sutherland for the formal introduction of Dr. Boucher. Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming to Grand Rounds. Um, it is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Helen Boucher, who is the Dean and uh, Professor of Medicine at Tufts University School of Medicine, as well as the Chief Academic Officer of the Tufts Medicine Health System. Uh, Dr. Boucher is an infectious disease physician, previously Chief of Division of Geographic Medicine and Infectious Disease at Tufts Medical Center, and the Director of the Stuart B. Levy Center for Integrated Management and Mic Antimicrobial Resistance. Um, her clinical interests include infections in immunocompromised patients, as well as Staph aureus, where she, her research is focused on development of new anti-infective agents for Staph aureus infections. Dr. Boucher serves as Associate Editor for Antimicrobial Agents and Chemotherapy, as well as Editor of the Sanford Guide uh, for Antimicrobial Therapy and the Infection and for Infectious Diseases Clinics of North America. Uh, in 2015, Dr. Boucher was appointed a voting member of the Presidential Advisory Council on Combating Antibiotic Resistant Bacteria and elected as treasurer of the Infectious Diseases Society of America. Dr. Boucher will be leading discussion today on the topic of running to stand still, progress and pitfalls in antimicrobial resistance in 2024. Please help me in welcoming Dr. Boucher. And can you hear me better now? Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for the honor of being with you uh, in person and virtually to present the Hoffman Ratson Lecture uh, here at the University of Miami. I never knew Dr. Hoffman, but I do know Dr. Ratson. He's a Tufts alum, as was mentioned in the introduction, and an incredible clinician uh, leader in infectious diseases. And I had the privilege of sharing some patients with him uh, over the past years. So really, it's a Huge honor to be here and uh, to be with you. And I'll say as a former chief resident, Dr. Sutherland, I used to be much more nervous about my introductions and we couldn't use notes in our day. So it was, I'd be in the shower reading these things and my husband would be, say, what are you saying? What are you doing? So thank you so much for the kindness. Um, great to see medical students. I saw a lot of medical students as I was walking in today and a lot of trainees in the audience. We'll talk about the problem of antimicrobial resistance and we'll dig into some sort of deep details about clinical trial designs and things, but I'll try to keep it at a level that's um, really meaningful for everybody who practices medicine. Because if I leave you with no other message today, then that this is a problem that affects all of us and one we all have to care about, whether you're a cardiologist, a rheumatologist, an intensivist, an oncologist, 
Um, that, that's my most important mission. So as we start, let's see if I can get the slides to advance here. Maybe I'll do it this way. I'm not having luck advancing. Let's see if we can, maybe the Zoom connection. So the first thing are my disclosures, and they were actually read. So I edit for antimicrobial agents and chemotherapy, the Sanford Guide, and ID Clinics of North America. So the, this problem of antimicrobial resistance, or AMR, and I'm going to do my best to avoid acronyms today, um, is nothing new, right? Bacteria evolve resistance in nature, and we make it worse by using antibiotics. But we're still, believe it or not, in 2024, quantifying the burden of this problem. And um, this is a paper from a couple of years ago from Chris, Chris Murray and colleagues, the same ones who did the COVID um, work that you're so familiar with. And they did a study looking back um, in 2019 and showed that in the world, 4.9 million at least died with uh, resistant infections. And of those, at least 1.27 million deaths were directly caused by antimicrobial resistance. So that's more than malaria, AIDS, and any number of other you know, very important diseases that we deal with in the world. So overuse of antibiotics is, is a problem. It's a big problem in our country, and it's a big problem around the world, and this is making the problem of resistance worse. So again, just to kind of highlight some of the issues that I know you all know well as practitioners, we still have things in our country that don't make much sense. And this is some work from Lori Hicks from the CDC, who is probably the leader in our country at looking at antibiotic use. Um, and this is looking at prescriptions by state and making the observation that you can see in this heat map, right? Red is where more are prescribed and the lighter colors are where less is prescribed. We have a high of 1,197 per thousand population in West Virginia and a low in Alaska of 462 per thousand. Huge differences. And we know that diseases aren't that different in those locations. So there are behavior issues and other issues, perhaps um, related to access to care and quality of care that are probably driving this. But uh, I show this to make the point that there's a lot for us to learn. There's also a difference in prescribing based on where persons go to get their care. And I'm sure, again, you see all this. We see this at our hospital. This is looking at, this data again from Lori, is looking at uh, inappropriate use of antibiotics for respiratory infections in outpatient settings and makes the very dramatic point that if someone goes to an urgent care center, their orders of magnitude more likely to get prescribed inappropriate antibiotics than if they go to a retail health center like a CVS Minute Clinic where um, the practitioners follow very clear sort of algorithms. And we can argue about that and whether algorithms are good or bad, but this observation tells us that um, the site of care matters a great deal. It also matters who's doing the prescribing. And you know, we could talk the, a whole hour about the issue of prescribing. And we'll talk a little bit about the science of antimicrobial stewardship as we go forward. But again, just want to make the point that as our healthcare system evolves and we focus on patients as consumers and patients dictating where they want to get their care, we have to be mindful of these types of things that drive uh, this problem. So what about COVID? COVID is still with us. We're um, back masking in our institution because we've had a significant bump in the post-holiday period. Um, and we learned during COVID that all of us, myself included, overprescribed antibiotics. Initially, it was out of a concern for secondary bacterial infection that didn't really pan out uh, in our COVID patients but it was also due to the fact that we redeployed our resources, right? Our antimicrobial stewards and infection prevention colleagues all got redeployed to focus on delivery of COVID therapies. So there wasn't the same kind of uh, rigor uh, and focus on appropriate antibiotic prescription, but this made the national news in places like the New York Times. And we're still seeing the effects of this today, right? As we see how the problem of resistance rolls out, the consequences of that overprescription, I don't think we fully understand yet. So what about the world? Um, this is not gonna be a global health talk, but antimicrobial resistance is a global problem. And many parts of the world, uh, low and middle income countries have a problem of access, right? Babies die from sepsis because there's no access to antibiotics, no access to care. So they're very different um, drivers in those places. And 
for many reasons, antibiotics are available over the counter in many countries, which leads to overuse. And you can see in this heat map that places like Asia and Africa have significant problems with overuse of antibiotics. And then the other thing to point out is all the gray in these maps are places for which there's no data, right? So Africa, you can see there's the data we have is bad, but most of the country um, lacks good data. And that, there are efforts underway, Welcome Trust and others to really help us get a better sense of what's happening. So what about animals, right? So humans, we know overuse of antibiotics in humans is a problem. It turns out that overuse of antibiotics in animals is a huge problem. And on a weight basis or gross amount of antibiotics used, we use many orders of magnitude more in animals. So over 60,000 tons of antibiotics are used in animals around the world every year. And they're used for different reasons. They're used to treat sick animals, which is important. They're also used to prevent infection and they are used for growth promotion to make the chicken fatter. So it weighs more and it sells for more, for example. And we're fortunate now that in over 40 countries around the world, where there are policies in place that uh, advise against and have consequences for the use of antibiotics for growth promotion. So in America, we have the veterinary feed directive that um, makes it unacceptable and with consequence to use antibiotics for growth promotion. The other thing to know about animals and that I learned a lot about on the Presidential Advisory Council where we had equal numbers of human physicians and animal physicians, vets, is that this problem differs a lot between animals. You know, pork are different than beef and chickens um, and fish. And that's when you think about livestock. The other kind of animal that's very interesting are companion animals, our dogs and our cats. So at Tufts, we have a vet school and we have great expertise in companion animal uh, veterinary medicine as well. And so we're studying the transmission of resistant bacteria from your dog to your household and your cat to your household. And it turns out it's very interesting and it happens. And antibiotics are sold to vets in a variety of different ways that are all unmonitored and very difficult to follow. So another interesting area. In terms of how much antibiotics are consumed, it, I mentioned it varies by animal, but you can see here, it's big, right? So this is a, another map looking at different species and you can see, I'll just draw your attention to the pink stripe in the middle, that's pig, so pork. Huge amounts of antibiotics are used in pork. And then at the top are fish in that blue, in the blue um, line. And what you see with the dotted lines are the error bars. We really don't understand how much antibiotics are used in fish. We know it's a lot, but this is just to give you a sense of the uncertainty uh, in this area. And you might've heard about things like vaccines um, for animals to prevent resistance and vaccines for fish. It was said that it's impossible to vaccinate fish because there's too many of them, it's too complicated. And a fun story is that at the first UN meeting about antimicrobial resistance that we'll talk about a little bit later, the um, prime minister of Norway described the program they use in Norway to vaccinate the salmon. It's very effective. It's a little bit costly, but it certainly can be done. So then there's the problem of no drugs. And this is what I've spent a lot of my career focusing on. If we look at uh, the history of discovering antibiotics back to the 1930s, among the most life-saving drugs ever in the world, um, we hit a period of real um, wasteland in the sort of 80s, 90s, and early 2000s. And the late John Bartlett, who was an incredible leader in infectious diseases, was very eloquent about the problem of seeing no new classes to treat gram-negative bacilli for over four, dec four decades. You might have seen last weekend in the lay press that there is a new class of antibiotic that was just uh, kind of brought public, very early stage of uh, investigation. But if this proves to be um, a medicine, it will be the first new class for gram negatives in close to 50 years now. So we at the Infectious Disease Society of America, led by Dr. Bartlett and many others, started a campaign back in the early 2000s called the Bad Bugs, No Drugs Campaign. And it was really to raise awareness to this problem. And you can see in these bars here, looking at antibiotic approvals by the US Food and Drug Administration, that the trend was very negative uh, going back to the 80s up into the early 2000, 2010 period. So we and many others wrote about this and tried to raise awareness and get people interested in developing new antibiotics. And you can see on the right that there was a glimmer of hope and we'll talk a little more about that. 
at the same time as this curve was going down, big pharma, that's Pfizer, Merck, and other big companies all left the antibiotic R&D space in a very big way. So these are companies that were you know, nominating new candidates to be antibiotics in the order of four or five a year. They all shut down, largely shut down their antibiotic development um, businesses. And you might say, well, I'm working in an academic medical center. Why do I care about that? Well, we care because it takes so long to develop an antibiotic, at least 10 years. Um, and the amount of discovery science and the expertise that's needed in basic science to just find new candidates requires a great deal of investment in energy and expertise. And what happened was that those investigators who worked in the big pharmaceutical companies either went to small biotechs, and we'll talk more about that, or they switched to fields like cancer, obesity, cardiovascular, and just left the space. So we had a brain drain as well. So the Pew uh, Charitable Trust and others kind of followed the pipeline for a number of years. And uh, there were a number of publications that just made the case that we're not seeing enough antibiotics. And in their um, 2020 report, there were only 43 uh, antibiotics in development that had potential activity against resistant organisms, the so-called escape pathogens, and those um, for gram-negative infections, which were killing a large uh, number of our patients in America. And the point here is that most of them won't make it to the end stage to be at our bedside so that we need more. And so we had another campaign at IDSA called the 10 by 20 campaign. We wanted 10 new antibiotics by the year 2020. And as you can see here, that goal was achieved, right? So from uh, ceftaroline, which was approved in 2010, to cefidrocol, which was approved in November of 2019, we actually got 14 new antibiotics. So that's good. Um, there are a number of sort of critiques of these new antibiotics in terms of a lot of them are a new kind of uh, engineering of an existing class of antibiotic, a lot of beta-lactam, beta-lactamase inhibitor combinations. And there was a lot of debate um, about how helpful these new antibiotics are. They're not as um, novel and innovative perhaps as a new class. For, from my perspective and for many of us on the front lines, any new antibiotic uh, that has efficacy in these areas is helpful because our patients need a number of options and we need to have a number of tools in our toolbox. So that was the good news. The bad news was that nobody's buying. So it turned out that the companies who made these antibiotics couldn't make enough money to continue manufacturing them. And so uh, in April of 2019, this is a look at the stock price of the five companies with the most recently approved antibiotics. And a cage in there in blue, um, which developed using a lot of US taxpayer dollars, um, a drug to treat gram-negative infections, had its stock price dropped to 17 cents, and that was just before they declared bankruptcy. These other companies all had stock prices below $10, and subsequent to this, a number of them also declared bankruptcy. So all these um, efforts, including our taxpayer dollar efforts that helped support the development of these antibiotics, weren't realized by our patients because these antibiotics didn't get to our patients. So this caused a lot of consternation among the community and in infectious diseases and others, and um, a number of us uh, tried to raise awareness of the problem in scientific journals, but also in the lay press. And you can see here in a number of lay publications, you know, we tried to make the case that the antibiotic market is not going to fix itself, that we have to think about some ways to fix it. So we'll come back and talk about this. You know, the other place that this manifested was in 2020. So now we're into COVID time. The World Health Organization came forward and declared that they were concerned about the antibiotic pipeline running dry. And Andrew Jacobs in the New York Times has had a particular interest in this area, and I think written very well about it. What was noteworthy here is that the WHO thought that this problem rose to their radar. They don't usually comment on these types of things, but that really um, made a signal globally and actually got the G7 interested in the problem of antibiotic resistance as well. So what else, what's happening at the same time? The Centers for Disease Control pays great attention to how we're doing with resistant bacteria. And they've issued a couple of threat reports. The first one was in 2013, the second one in 2019. And in the 2019 update, there was some good news, right? In the hospital side, we saw almost 20% fewer deaths from antibiotic resistant infections and 28% um, uh, fewer deaths in hospitals. So 
that was good. And that means that infection control works and you have incredible infection control program here. Um, so I know that you all are well aware of the importance of all the work we do to prevent infections, everything from hand hygiene to um, very rigorous care when we do procedures and with our catheters and uh, avoiding uh, environmental contamination and all those things. So the good news, that works. Less good was what was happening in the community. So as the time things are getting a little better in the hospital, they were getting worse in the community. And we saw an increase in 2.8 million antibiotic resistant infections in the community and 35,000 or more deaths related to antibiotic resistance and problems like drug resistant gonorrhea, which I know is everywhere now and, and ESBL producing gram negatives and things like urinary tract infections and other places that are manifesting in the community. So much work to do. So that really brings the question of where do we go from here? How do we fix this? And one lesson I think we learned from COVID that sadly we're already forgetting is the need to prepare. And um, Richard Ebright, who's a great leader in this area, had a great piece with Kevin Outerson in Stat News saying that failing to plan is planning to fail. And we need to plan for this problem of antibiotic resistance, which is here and getting worse. And we uh, on the PACCARB had a whole report at the request of the Secretary of Health and Human Services to prepare for the pandemic of antimicrobial resistance and to prepare for any pandemic in the setting of antimicrobial resistance. So if the next pandemic is a virus, another respiratory virus, we'll still have resistant bacterial infections probably getting worse in that setting. And so I would commend to you this report, uh, the URL is shown at the bottom that goes into great detail on everything from needing a workforce to do this, infection prevention, new products and vaccines, ways to manage data, ways to communicate well and have the trust of the population, something that we didn't do so well with COVID and we're still paying for. The approach to this problem, it's a wicked problem, uh, as the business people would say, and it requires a one health approach, right? Because resistance is related between animals, humans, and the environment. It's a true one health program uh, problem. And so anybody who wants to fix it needs to think about those things, right? So we need access to care. We need a workforce to deliver good care. We need surveillance so we know how bad the problem is, uh, research and development for infection prevention, for diagnostic tests, for treatments, uh, and then antimicrobial stewardship, which we'll talk about. So what about awareness? We sit here in this room and you all go do your rounds in the hospital and talk to your um, stewardship colleagues deal with this every day. But in, in the world, in our citizens, in our towns, people still don't know this problem very well. And in 2024, I, I'm kind of sad to say that I think the biggest problem in antimicrobial resistance is awareness. And Mark Mendelson from South Africa put out this tweet in October of 2020. So think of what was happening in October of 2020. COVID was really bad. We didn't yet have a vaccine. So it was a tough time. And he said, COVID-19, 1 million deaths in 10 months. AMR predicted 10 million deaths per year by 2050. We have yet to overcome the hurdle of antimicrobial resistance, not having a single easily identifiable face for what this problem means. We don't have a breast cancer coalition for AMR. Most recently, uh, this movie was put out called The Race Against Resistance. And again, I put the link uh, to watch it on YouTube. And this young woman uh, is Tori Kinneman, and she contracted an antimicrobial resistant infection when she was a college gymnast and almost lost her life. And in the movie, she and her mom tell the story of what it was like to go through this. And Tori says, how would my outcome have been different if we didn't have that second or third antibiotic to treat my infection? So it's not a long watch, but I, I highly commend you watching it because I think Tori and a number of others are doing a lot of good work to help bring a face to this problem. The Wellcome Trust put out a great report um, that really breaks this down into five, five ways to increase the understanding uh, and get people motivated to do something about this problem. So frame antibiotic resistance as undermining medical care and modern medicine, right? I've had to tell patients that I couldn't clear them for transplantation because we couldn't treat their infection. I'm sorry. And I've had to send them home on hospice. That is awful and nothing when I started infectious disease and, and I see colleagues here, when any of us started infectious disease practice, we thought we would have to do, but most of my colleagues across the country have had to do that. It, it makes further care impossible, like a transplant, like a joint replacement. Explain the fundamentals succinctly that gets to the communication issue. 
emphasize that it affects everyone, you, me, my children, my friends, focus on the problem being here and now and encourage immediate action. Very important, sounds easy, but we're not doing it well enough. We also need a champion. And as I look around the room, how many people recognize this lady? Dame Sally Davies. So nobody. So Dame Sally is from the UK and she is now the United Nations envoy for antimicrobial resistance. She did a great service in the UK over the last about 15 years being the spokesperson for AMR mm -hmm. and globally. Um, people in the UK all know Dame Sally. They know what she does. And I would submit, and many of us uh, have been advocating to get a United States spokesperson champion for this problem so that everyone knows um, who, who uh, is leading these efforts. So let's turn our attention now to surveillance. That is, how do we know what the problem is and how bad it is? I would imagine that here, like at my hospital, I know how resistant my pseudomonas are in the SICU compared to the medical intensive care unit compared to the transplant unit. That's great. But in our country, we still don't know enough about um, how much resistant pseudomonas is in Massachusetts versus Florida versus California. Uh, and Samir Kadri and I had this piece a couple of years ago looking at a VA study, and I know there are VA colleagues in the room, a really good study that looked at mortality from resistant infections in veterans. And we just raised a number of questions because even that data, the VA data, which is among the best data we have, um, didn't allow answering all the questions and required modeling, right? So we raised questions like our mortality rates in veterans generalizable to the whole population. What about using attributable mortality? That changes over time and has its biases. And we made the point that associating resistance with death still requires better data uh, in our country. So one way to get that better data is to use the CDC uh, National Healthcare Safety Network antibiotic use module. And many of our hospitals are using it. I don't know if you all are, but it's very labor intensive. Um, hospitals aren't really paid to do this. So the health system ends up paying for it. It's complicated. Um, and we and others have sort of raised questions about incentivizing people to use this so we can have better data, paying hospitals and, and colleagues for doing this work. So what about stewardship? Um, how staff, do you all talk to your stewardship colleagues on a regular basis? Hands, yes? So, 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 okay, I see you, so, so. Um, stewardship is the science of using antibiotics the best way in every patient. So it's the right drug at the right dose for the right duration in every patient. Um, it also is associated with decreasing resistance and saving money, but it's not an intervention that's designed just to save money. It's designed to improve patient care. And it's now mandated by the government for all of our hospitals and in the uh, long-term care setting and in the outpatient setting uh, coming soon. And we have centers of excellence, and I believe you guys are one, yep. Um, and more of our healthcare systems are investing resources, but we need more. So um, this is a really important area and part of, the, part of the solution. What about using these new antibiotics? It turns out that we infectious disease doctors are very hesitant to use the new antibiotics that we have because we want to save them so that they work. And uh, this was called into question a couple of years ago um, by a very provocative talk at our national meeting who said, how can these new therapies, you know, why do you think we're going to make new therapies if you doctors won't use them? And it made the case that we need to, to accelerate our guidelines process. So the IDSA did that and developed a guidance document for treatment of the most resistant infections and in that it's, it's updated in an ongoing basis. Um, so to be much more useful to clinicians. So the most recent update came out in June of this year, and it focuses on resistant gram-negative infections. Um, it will continue to expand, but I would commend this to you if you're treating patients who have particularly tough infections, and it gives good guidance, and we hope that that will lead to better use uh, and, and better uptake of these new agents. So what about physicians? So Dr. Weiss and I this morning talked about the problem of the ID physician workforce and the match. Um, I don't know if you all have talked about that here, but the ID programs in our country don't fill. Um, and there are a number of issues with that. And part of it has to do with the compensation and the fact that ID is a um, non-procedural specialty, right? It's an intellectual spe specialty. So a couple of things are underway to try to incentivize more people to go into this field. One is loan repayment. A lot of work has been done in this area and there is now bipartisan support in Congress 
uh, to launch a pilot for loan repayment for infectious diseases, and then a lot of work um, on the compensation side to ensure fair compensation. So things really out in the weeds like the E&M codes that infectious disease physicians use, um, changing the fee schedule, and really um, working hard with our colleagues at insurance companies and CMS uh, to try to raise the compensation of ID docs, but more work to do. So on the federal level, we have a national action plan for combating antibacterial resistance. We're in the second iteration uh, that was redone in 2021. Five goals, I won't belabor them, but the idea is to get coordination across all the arms of government. So FDA, CDC, NIH, the Department of Defense. And I have the privilege of working in one, one of these areas um, on an NIH um, research committee called the Antibacterial Resistance Leadership Group. It's a very large, multi-investigator group across the country led by Vance Fowler from Duke and Chip Chambers um, from UCSF. And our job is to improve clinical research to impact prevention, diagnosis, and treatment of resistant infections. I chair what's called the Innovation Work Group. And this is a very um, fun, I'll say to the young people here, this is one of the most fun things I've gotten to do in my career. It's a collaboration between academic doctors, including trainees, so we have fellows, statisticians, industry colleagues, government colleagues from a variety of areas, social scientists, right? So how do we communicate about what we're doing? And then patient advocate. It turns out that patients haven't really been at the table um, for anti-infective drug development in anywhere near the way they have for things like cancer. So we focus on two things, improving clinical trials outcomes and quality of life measurement in our patients. And the end point that I'm going to tell you a little bit about, if you can bear with me a little bit, is uh, the end point called DOOR, or desirability of outcome ranking. So this is a way to change a standard non-inferiority trial that just says yes or no, the drug is no less good than the comparator, uh, into a way to ascertain differences that are meaningful to the patient in an ordinal way. So we use outcomes to analyze patients rather than patients to analyze outcomes. And this was developed by Scott Evans, who you see here, who's a statistician uh, at GW and just a brilliant, brilliant guy. In general, the idea is that we develop an endpoint that weights outcomes, right? So the worst thing that could happen in a trial is that you die. So that's the worst. Along the way, you could fail or have an absence of clinical response you could have infectious complications. I mean, if you have one infection, say you have a bloodstream infection and then you get endocarditis, a heart valve infection, that's an infectious complication, that's bad. Um, or a serious adverse event. You have to come back to the hospital, you have a prolonged hospitalization. And you basically add all that up and you go from a zero, which is the best outcome, to a five, which is dead, the worst outcome, and can ascertain more about how that uh, translates to the patient. So the first way we looked at this was at a very, um, you might say, unsexy trial, complicated urinary tract infection. It's unsexy, but it's very common, and it causes a lot of morbidity and some mortality in our country. This is Dr. Um, Jessica Howard Anderson, one of my mentees. She's at Emory now, but she was a fellow um, when she did a lot of this work, actually. And she looked at um, the door endpoint in complicated urinary tract infections. And in this group, we worked together with industry colleagues who shared data with us from three pivotal trials of new antibiotics for urinary tract infections as shown here. So phosphomycin, um, uh, that's a more recent study compared to Piperacil and Tazobactam, Cifidrocol, a very new antibiotic compared to imipenem in the middle, and Doripenem compared to levofloxacin. So the industry colleagues shared all this data with us at the NIH, and our group did the analysis that led uh, to the work that I'll show you. So great partnership of data sharing in the interest of advancing uh, the science of clinical trials. And I won't get into all the details because of time, but the publications are shown here if you're interested. This is a high level look at the door outcome and you can see by the colors, right? Um, the green is the zero, I showed you this alive with no bad events. And all the way on the right is death in red. And in, as you would expect in urinary tract infections, we don't see much death. That's good. There's a couple of messages that kind of jump out as you look at these three different trials. There's very little difference between treatments in each of the trials, which is good. And you can see that by the probability numbers on the right. But there's quite a difference between the trials over time. 
And that's kind of interesting. So we looked at that in more detail, as you can see here. And again, I'm not gonna um, walk through uh, the data in detail, but I'll tell you that one of the tools we have now with this endpoint is we can prioritize looking at efficacy or safety. And if I can draw your attention to the bottom to the Dory Penham trial, you can see that if you um, look at uh, Dory Penham on the left, levofloxacin on the right, and levofloxacin is a drug that we use a great deal in clinical practice. Uh, if you see that one outlier uh, on the right, that's levofloxacin's clinical response um, was significantly better when you just looked at the clinical response. So if you're dealing with a patient, you could pick one of these drugs over the other, whether you were concerned more about efficacy or safety. So this tool allows that kind of insight that we can translate at the bedside to our patients. So this was kind of the proof of principle um, of this trial. And we've now taken it into a number of other indications and have the goal of doing it in a prospective fashion. So the next trial I want to tell you about is using door and intra-abdominal infection. And do you recognize this lady? This is Tori Kinneman, the lady spokesperson I told you about. She's a resident at Duke now and um, pursuing a career in infectious diseases. And she took a year, at Duke they have a year to do science. And she went to the FDA as an ORISE fellow and got to look at the huge database they have at the FDA of trials. And she looked at nine trials and did a door analysis on those nine trials um, in intra-abdominal infection. And the results are shown here. It's very interesting. I won't go through this in detail, but the paper is interesting. And the, the ability of her being embedded in the FDA meant that she could look at data from drugs that got approved and never got approved. And those data are so-called proprietary. The FDA has them. She was an FDA employee to do this. And we were able to collaborate to do the project, which is really, really great. And for any of you thinking about um, research, these ORISE fellowships are really great. So in the future, we hope to take this prospectively into other clinical trials. Um, we're thinking about better ways to collect data prospectively and continue to work with partners. Um, and this technique is used in a lot of other therapeutic areas as well, cardiology, oncology, uh, for example. So what about quality of life? What about how patients feel with their infections? Turns out that's not something we've done a great job with in infectious diseases either. And this is um, Dr. Sarah Dornberg from UCSF, who's leading our quality of life task force. And the first exercise here is we've done systematic reviews just to see what's known about quality of life in these four major indications. Um, and these, this is gonna be published very soon actually, so stay tuned. We're also asking the question, who should decide how the patient feels? Should it be the clinician who says, Mrs. Jones, uh, Mr. Jones, how are you feeling today at the study visit and checking a box? Or should the patient do it? So we have another interesting study looking at that uh, coming forward. So as we move forward, we're gonna be looking at door and invasive fungal infections. So for the transplant colleagues in the room, I think will be very interesting. Uh, we're looking at atypical mycobacteria, Clostridium difficile. And then uh, I mentioned the quality of life uh, based on whether the patient or the clinician decides. Uh, and in the infection prevention world, we're thinking about decolonization as a surrogate endpoint, which would be quite interesting. Okay. So I was asked to tell you a little bit about our center at Tufts, uh, the Levy Center for Antibiotic Resistance. It was established in 2018 as a partnership between our university and, and, the, and the health system. We now have 46 faculty um, from our two institutions and seven affiliates from outside institutions. And we focus in four areas, stewardship and public policy, uh, clinical and fundamental research, education and outreach. I'll just tell you briefly. So on the stewardship front, we're very active um, in a number of ways locally and nationally and have gotten more deeply into health equity. Um, antibiotic resistance is definitely a health, health equity problem where more marginalized persons suffer negative consequences from these infections. On the research front, um, we have uh, over $40 million in research funding, uh, great productivity uh, in scholarly work. And we were recently awarded a grant from the NIH called the CO6 grant to build out a laboratory um, for combination drug development that also has in it a space for collaboration between clinicians and basic scientists um, to further translate this work. Uh, so we're very excited about that. We have work going on to develop novel therapies in bacterial infections as well as tuberculosis. Uh, we have phage um, therapy studies ongoing 
uh, and, and a number of other projects. And we're very interested in collaborating if anyone's interested in collaborating. On the education and outreach front, you know, this whole problem of awareness, we're thinking about handling this in, in a variety of different ways. I don't know how many people know, but the way people in America got turned on to recycling was when elementary school students, not high school students, elementary school students came home and told their parents, we have to recycle. So we've started having programs in the undergraduate level for sure. Um, and we have scholarships for undergrads to work in our labs and to work on clinical projects. Um, and then we have a number of high school programs uh, that include what we call a mini med school program for high school students. It's all focused on antibacterial resistance where they come for a two week residential course at Tufts. Um, and then we have Brockton High School students who that's a sort of a inner city um, lot of students who would be first generation students going to college who um, have interactions, including a poster day where they come to Tufts uh, and interactions with um, high school, college and medical students with industry as well that lead to further um, opportunities for those students. What do we lack? We lack a clinical trials network, right? So the ARLG group that, that several of us work on works on clinical trial design, but it doesn't have the budget to actually do clinical trials. So we need a recovery trial like the UK had for COVID for antibiotic resistance. And one colleague, David Patterson in Australia, has just announced a new Asian clinical trials network that really answers this question. And I hope we'll be able to tell you uh, if I ever come back in a few years that we're getting there in America, um, because that's the way we're gonna do this the best and the fastest for our patients. So I'll close up by telling you a little bit about what's happening on the regulatory front, right? How are we gonna get more drugs? So we and others have spent a lot of time thinking about how to get the best drugs. A drug to just treat pseudomonas, for example. Uh, not to treat urinary tract infections in general, but to just treat a serious infection. So we develop white papers, we've had meetings, lots of conversations with our FDA colleagues about how to do this, and guidelines were developed, but no one had succeeded. So from November of 2019 until just recently in May of this year, or last year, uh, there was no drug approved, no, back, no antibiotic approved. So the first drug was approved in May, uh, Sulbactam Duralbactam, and that drug is approved or treatment of one specific pathogen, Acinetobacter boboniensis. So it's the first so-called single pathogen drug uh, in this space, and that's really a good thing, um, and uh, gives a lot of hope that maybe we'll see more in the future. This is the study um, led by Keith Kay and colleagues looking at this new drug um, versus colistin, a toxic old drug, both with imipenem, and it showed that the new drug was almost superior, which is not a surprise because the old drug is so toxic. Um, it was very hard study to do, uh, 59 sites in 16 countries to get a small number of patients, but they got it done and they got approved by the FDA. So that's good news. Whether that is a market and that company succeeds, we don't know. So stay tuned. Um, coming back to the National Action Plan, um, we're working hard across all these things. We mentioned uh, the US need for a US champion. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about goal four ways to accelerate uh, research and development. So we need incentives to do this. We need to find ways that people wanna develop antibiotics for our patients. So those incentives are broken down into two broad buckets, so-called push incentives, which happen before FDA approval and full incentives after. So the most successful push incentive is shown here at Carbex, which is a public-private partnership for early development of antibiotics. It's funded by BARDA, uh, in the US government, as well as Welcome Trust and all the others shown here. So it, it's growing uh, with global support. And they have 29 active projects, 14 therapeutics, all in new antibiotic classes, rapid diagnostics and prevention therapies like uh, monoclonal antibodies and phage. Great science, lots of excitement, which is really good. The AMR Action Fund is on the pull side. Oh, let me back up. Um, it is a kind of a move by big pharma. So several big pharma companies contributed $1 billion to create the AMR Action Fund a couple of years ago. And their goal is to advance four antibiotics by the year 2030. And they've announced the ones that they're gonna support. Uh, the picture uh, didn't make it in the slide, but they're looking at things like prosthetic joint infection, right? Joint replacement is the most common surgery in our country in many centers today. And prosthetic joint infection is a debilitating infection. So 
antibiotics for that problem, and then common problems like UTI and pneumonia, as well as Clostridium difficile. Globally, we have GuardP, which is another public-private partnership. They kind of copied us, our 10 by 20, they have five by 25 uh, efforts to get five new antibiotics, and they're focused on a lot of neonatal infections as well as adult infections. And then the most important pull incentive to share with you is the Pasteur Act, which is a subscription model, so-called so Netflix model, where a company or entity would develop an antibiotic for the most resistant infection meeting certain criteria, get it approved by the FDA, and then be guaranteed a return on that investment. Importantly, that return would be delinked from how much they sold. So there'd be no incentive to overuse that antibiotic. It's linked to good stewardship. Um, and it's focused on the antibiotics we need most. It's supported by both houses of Congress, wide, wide political support, um, and has been introduced and reintroduced uh, as recently as last April. So we're very um, hopeful about that. And this is my advocate hat. If you get one of those emails that says, take a minute to email your Congress people, I encourage you to do it because they really do listen. It's slow progress, but they do listen. And um, this is how we make change in this space. The UK is ahead of us. They've done the same thing, a subscription pilot with two drugs that we have, um, and they were successful pilots and they're going into their next phase. So that's um, encouraging. Globally, I mentioned the G7. Antibiotic resistance has been part of the G7 meeting for the past several years and will likely continue to do so. And you might say, well, why do we care? It's just politicians getting together. But it actually matters because those statements um, and the outputs of those meetings do come back and influence funding in our government and other places that matter. What if nobody will do this in industry? We're left with nonprofit approaches. And Nielsen and colleagues had this paper in the New England Journal a couple of years ago, looking at a nonprofit approach to developing new antibiotics. And it's possible, but very challenging. And the part that's very challenging is actually on the manufacturing and getting through the final development stage. Nonprofits just aren't designed to do that. So when and if that will be successful is, is unknown, but I wanted to mention it. So I'm gonna end with a quote from Stuart Levy after whom our center is named. And in 1976, Dr. Levy did an experiment uh, in Dover, Massachusetts, where he got chickens in a chicken coop and fed them antibiotics and showed that the chickens got fatter and that they developed resistance. And that study was published and highly, highly criticized. Turned out to be very prescient uh, for where we are today. And he said, now in 1996, at an Institute of Medicine, now National Academies symposium, antibiotics are uniquely societal drugs because our individual use affects others in the community Better stewardship incentives and establishment of special regulatory category will improve how they're used and developed through incentives to industry. That was a long time ago. So we still have work to do. Uh, and I wanna say thank you so much for the honor of being with you and hope that this was useful and look forward to your questions. Thanks so much. Thank you, Dr. Bouchard, Dean Bouchard. That was incredible, enlightening and very uh, exciting. Thank you. I'll begin, maybe there's questions from the audience and the over almost 100 people online, but um, it seems to me from a lay person's perspective as a non-ID person, that there's so much fragmentation in the United States. When you look at the CDC, the FDA, the NIH, the White House, the National Academies, and it seems as though this fragmentation in one hand is good because there's checks and balances, but on the other hand, maybe is there a vision that perhaps this might be somehow an impediment to the accessibility, affordability, the acceptability of all these drugs? Yeah, so it, it's a great call out. And in fact, the reason for the National Action Plan, and it was um, uh, developed under President Obama, and Dave Relman from Stanford and other uh, infectious disease leaders in our country were part of that. The whole reason for the National Action Plan was to bring the governmental colleagues together and to create accountability. And so if you read it, it's a long document, but it's all about FDA, CDC, NIH, Department of Defense, things that we don't even think about or I never did, um, the need for them to work together and think about how to use uh, 
the resources that we have to be rowing in the same direction to solve this problem. It's And that's what on the presidential advisory committee, they brought in these external ex expert people to advise the government. And so part of what we tried to do was to encourage that collaboration and partnership. It's very complicated. And any of you who follow politics, you know, some of these areas have budgets that are set by the legislature, some don't. They're all focused on their budgets. Um, it's very, very interesting and challenging and lots of checks and balances. And I think um, having served from 2015 to 2023, it's sobering actually how much um, bureaucracy there is. And it takes a special kind of person who can kind of thrive in that environment and get things moving forward. Um, we saw glimmers of this in COVID, you know, with the different branches of government. And I think one thing I'll share is that advocacy, you know, going to Washington, and I know several of your colleagues have done this. You go around and talk to the Congress people, and I testified at a Senate hearing in July, and then I spent two days going around and talking to all the physicians in Congress. There's actually such a thing as a group of physicians in Congress. So going around and talking to them, as well as um, my local, you know, Congress people, they do listen and they do care, but they have agendas. You know, they have their agenda, right? It's the bridge and it's the homeless people and then medicine is somewhere in there, right? And so you have to find a way to be so compelling that you get onto their agenda and and help something else that they're doing. And so having um, things like the Pasteur be bipartisan and bicameral, meaning both sides of the aisle, both the House and the Senate, that makes a big difference. Um, but a lot of it does come back to money and you know things that are not in our realms per se as physicians. But all that to say, I would encourage you if you have the opportunity to advocate and you're interested, um, whether it's about this or another thing, to really consider doing it because our voices do matter. Thank you. Any questions online? Over here, I see. Oh, yeah, oh, Gabe, one second. Let me bring you the microphone so we can hear you. Okay. Yeah. You know, my question is regarding the effect on outcomes like mortality that the stewardship has in ICU care, for example. You know, we know that, you know, starting antibiotic early in severe sepsis, you know, reduce the risk of mortality. But what about a stewardship itself? Does it have any effect on mortality? Yeah, it's a great question. So the question is about what do we know about stewardship and mortality? And in fact, there are studies. So, um, I'm dating myself a little bit, but I was hired in 2002 at Tufts to start our first stewardship program. And some of the early studies back in the 2000 to 2010 range looked at just that question. And there are studies that show that in pneumonia, in bloodstream infection, especially staph aureus bloodstream infection, that good stewardship, that is getting the most appropriate drug to, as fast as possible to the patient saves lives. I think the staph aureus example is probably the most um, reproduced in the literature, but there are a number of studies in pneumonia. And that that's why I made that point, that good stewardship is good patient care. And um, I think for the house staff who said, oh, maybe Mets and Mets, I talked to my stewardship colleagues, they really want to help us pick the best agents for our patients. And um, in the ICU, in the transplant world, places where minutes matter, um, that's really important. And so having good algorithms, and for us, it's epic. I don't know if you guys are on it, but you know, having all of that built in and then really building those relationships with your colleagues um, does translate into better outcomes. Dr. Deblecki lewis Great talk. Thank you so much. Um, really nice. And I love that you brought in the... Um, sort of patient satisfaction with care and patient-centered outcomes. And I guess one of the things I think really ties into that for our patients who are experiencing antimicrobial resistant infections is the availability of oral antibiotics mm -hmm. that can treat those infections. And, you know, very often we can, we can just barely treat the infection, but then um, there's really no oral option for, for a stepping down or outpatient therapy. And I'm wondering about if you can comment on the pipeline for yeah. oral antibiotics for these infections. It's almost non-existent, right? So I didn't really make that point, but um, the focus today is on 
drug resistant gram negatives that are hospital infections, IV therapy, the oral things would be in like gonorrhea, you know, specific things, but we need oral agents for ESBL producing organisms. And we've had a couple that have failed. So sulopenem is still being um, developed. And there's a lot, I'll just be honest, right? If it gets approved, stewardship is going to be really important because there's going to be so much temptation to overuse a drug like that. But we do need oral options and um, we need stewardship of those oral options. And I think you think the market's difficult on a relatively high cost parenteral antibiotic. There's no appetite, I would submit, for a high cost pill antibiotic, right? This is not cancer. It's not immunotherapy. We, there's no um, precedent for pricing an oral antibiotic the way we might price an oral immunosuppressive therapy or something. And the oncologists are grappling with that exactly that exact issue now with the availability of oral chemotherapy. So indeed, this has been an enlightening talk, very informative and impactful for all of us. So thank you, Dean Bouchard. Thank We're you. grateful for your presence. Thank you. Thank you.